When we last left our story of the children of Israel, they were camped out on the side of the mountain, uh, waiting for what? We don't know what they're waiting for. We know what they were waiting for. They didn't know what they were waiting for. They didn't know what was what was in stock. They were just told, camp by this mountain and wait. And above all, don't go up on the mountain. Don't touch the mountain. Put a barrier in case any animals that you have, any of your sheep or, or uh, uh, the cattle, try to go up the mountain. We don't want them to go up the mountain. We didn't. Nobody goes up the mountain except Moses. Moses went up the mountain, and then he was told, go get Aaron. Aaron can come up the mountain with you. So Moses and Aaron go up on the mountain, still didn't know what was coming. They kind of had to take life you know, one move at a time, didn't they? Because they left Egypt walking toward the Red Sea, and they're probably wondering, Right, Moses, have you got an exit strategy for us here? We're heading toward the Red Sea. I've never been there, but I know that there's just this big body of water, and uh, we've got six million people here, and we've got a few boats to get us away from Pharaoh. And then it became a kind of dire emergency because they could see Pharaoh's army coming after them. And so just step by step, they had to take the, the trip down to Sinai. Uh, God's going to wipe out the, the Egyptian army. We see that test. We see also the tests of, okay, Moses, you wiped out the army. That's cool. But here we are walking in the desert. I'm kind of thirsty. Canteen's empty. What do we do now, Moses? So step by step, they're heading toward Sinai. Moses, all right, we're, gonna, we're on our way down to Sinai. Well, what are, we what are we waiting for then? Why are we going there? They didn't know any of that. But we do because when we get the when we get to Exodus, the 20th chapter, we see exactly why they were heading toward Sinai. And Moses went up on Sinai, and we looked at a couple of kind of sidetracked stories in the Bible that relate to this. But Exodus 20 is when we get the word from God. The word from God to all of the people. And we looked at a couple of psalms that were written about the word of God. We also took a pause and celebrated Passover. I mean, not Passover. We, we celebrated the Pentecost. And Pentecost was already a day that they had planned to celebrate because that was when they recognized the giving of the law on Mount Sinai in the 50-day journey between leaving Egypt and then heading down to Sinai. So here they are, camped out at Sinai. Moses goes up, and uh, Aaron goes up with him, and make sure that you put a boundary on the mountain, consider it holy, and then God spoke all these words. So look in, the, in the chapter 20, here we get to breaking these down. These are the Ten Commandments. Do you realize that the Ten Commandments is the most influential thing that has ever been written That's right. in right. any language, in any culture, in right. any civilization, in the history of people? Nothing has made more impact than the Ten Commandments. It's an amazing thing. God's, and it's only 120 words long. He recount them all the words, 120 words. These are the most, the most impressive, the most important thing that has ever been written by anyone anywhere. Okay? So here we are. The God spoke all these words, and here is the first commandment. Verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have other gods beside me. You will not have any other gods beside me. That's the first commandment. Mm -hmm. Make sure that God is the one and only. Mm -hmm. The one and only God. All right. So, let's break this down. We're going to look at it word by word here. We're going to 
We're just going to go through each one of those things here. God says, I, that's the first, that's the first word here, I, uses the personal pronoun, me, I myself. So God is, is proclaiming to Moses that there is a first person singular pronoun to describe himself as God. The one and only. He is the God. There are no other gods. Every other thing that people worship is a figment of their imagination. Amen. Okay? These are all imaginary gods. If you build an idol towards something and you bow down and worship it, it is just you playing pretend. Okay? That's all there is to it. You can pretend that's a god, but it's not going to save you. Okay? And what God is saying here, me, I, the first person singular pronoun. Now this is really important. Singular. There is only one. And for Moses, this is a huge revelation. Now he had met God for the people of, of Israel. This is a huge revelation. All of their lives, they have been surrounded by multiple gods. Mm -hmm. In Egypt, there were gods for everything. They decided, this is going to be a god, this is going to be a god, this is going to be a god, the sun's a god, the river's a god, the bird is a god, the beetle is a god, the cow is a god, everything's a god. So uh, they were just, the frog is a god, the fly is a god, everything's a god. So they just were making gods out of everything. And when God redeemed his people and brought them out into the land of Egypt, or out of the land of Egypt, first thing he needs to tell them is that there's just me. It's all me. You want to worship gods? You want to have lots and lots of gods? Forget it. It's all me. I am the only one. I, and he says, I am the Lord your God. Remind you, when you see L-O-R-D in their capitals, as in small caps, what is underneath that is the proper name of God. Okay? So, Yahweh. It is, it is four letters in Hebrew. Y-H-W-H. Yahweh. And we don't exactly know how to pronounce it because they didn't pronounce it. They considered it too holy. And they, so they just passed it. Now they use the, the, the pronunciation of the Lord. And that's the, the, the way that they would do it. They would see the word. They would just say the Lord. And so that's how it comes to our Bible. But when you look at it, you see it's a, if the type is just a little bit different. Realize that is God saying his name. I am is how we would translate. So actually, there's a kind of redundancy here. He says, I, I am. Yeah. Okay? Because that one is in there as well. And he says, I am. That's the proper name of God. Remember, this is the name when Moses saw bush. God at the burning bush. Mm -hmm. And he asked him, who can I say is sending me back into Egypt? In other words, God, who are you? And he says to him, I am. You tell him, I am sent you. And God gives his name as I am. So it is no coincidence that when Jesus speaks to his disciples and to the, to the learners and to the crowd, he tells them things like, I am the bread of life. Amen. No coincidence. Jesus knew what he was doing, okay? And when he says, I am the vine and you are the branches, Jesus knew what he was doing. When he said, I am the way and the truth and the life, he knew what he was saying. He was using a piece of, of God's name that was given to Moses and given to the children of Israel, and he was claiming that on himself. So don't let anybody tell you that Jesus never claimed to be God. Over and over again, he used the name of God in reference to himself. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. And he goes on and on using that. And 
we think, well, maybe he's just describing himself. Maybe he's not saying that he really is God. Well, yeah, well, then how can you explain the fact that people picked up rocks and were trying to kill him? him? That's right. Okay? Mm -hmm. They were only trying to kill him because they got it. They understood he was claiming to be God. He said he was God over again by saying, I am. That's the way that God talks. I am. Notice that is not an I was. Okay? Not I was, like I used to be God. I, I'm, I, was, I was way back there and I, I did this in days past. Like I was what I was. No. I am is a present tense. So whenever we read it, God is still present tense. That's something that's happened. It happened then and it was in the present then. And as we read it now, it's still in the present tense. Because God is now. He is always going on right now. And He is in present tense. Not only that, but we can, we can decipher a little bit of the, of the verb tense to know that there's also an element of causing wrapped up in there. So you can even say, I cause to be. I'm the one that makes things happen. The I'm the one that brings it about. I'm the one that said, let there be light, and boom, there is light. And I say, and I create, and I continue to uphold. God is the one that makes things keep going. Amen. He's the one that brings things about. So he's the one that is the causation element in everything. So I am the Lord, your God. And he also makes it personal. I'm the Lord, your God. Mm -hmm. Your God. You realize that? That God belongs to us and we belong mm -hmm. to Him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. Amen. He said that when He later on He's going to establish this covenant. I will be your God and you will you be my people. Mm -hmm. That's the basic elements of this covenant we have with God. Our relationship that we have with God is He's my God. I am his man. That's how we put this relationship on its, on its wheels and get it down the, down the road. God belongs to us. And, and we said, this is my God. The only God, the real God, happens to also be my God. That's right. Can you imagine that? These people have been grown up in Egypt where there's, there's a God and you built a, a, a statue to him and then you killed something and you, you left it for him or... Or you sacrifice something to keep them off your back, and, and can you, they had no relationship with their gods that they worshipped in Egypt. They wouldn't say, "Oh, the I, the sun is my god," and and I have a relationship with the sun. They worshipped the sun, but they didn't have a relationship with the sun. They they worshipped the Nile River, but they didn't have a relationship with the Nile River. They worshipped. Uh, cows and monkeys and birds and whatever, but they did not have relationships with the deities that they proclaimed. But God is saying we can have a relationship. That sets the worship of the real God apart from all other gods that anybody would ever worship. We can have a relationship with the creator of the universe. That's an amazing thing. Your God. I am the Lord, your God. And he gives us a history lesson. The God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now, worshiping God, finding out who God is, that's an, that's an important thing. It's a personal thing. And it has a historical element. But, you know, God is just more than history. God is more than, say, a philosophy. Some people will only go so far in the search for God to, to have something to think about. They're like, like uh, they're just going to prove that God exists and leave it at that. And some of our founding fathers in the United States, that's as far as they went. They say, well, there's a God up there somewhere, and he just kind of sets everything in motion and we can go with you that far, and then we'll just leave it. 
But no, the God that we worship is the God who's going to get his hands into our lives. And the God who's going to make things happen for us. This is a personal history he is recounting here. I'm the God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Mm -hmm. Wow, how about that? Don't we want to be delivered? Doesn't everybody want to be delivered? Amen. This is this is a cry for freedom that all of us can yes. express and all of us would long for. I was just um, reading yesterday about a cry for deliverance and freedom that was uh, that was just being expressed from from the heart of this young woman. She she was really struggling with being held back and in bondage, and there is actually a whole internet movement to free Britney Spears from the, the uh, constraints of her parents who run her, her dad who runs her career and all of her money and uh, tell her where to go and what to do and what albums to put out and stuff like that. So apparently she doesn't have control over her own life. And she is trying to rally her fans to support her. And there is actually got a hashtag, Free Britney. Hashtag Free Britney. Well, we, we can identify with that. We don't have the struggles that she does for sure. I don't have millions of internet fans making hashtags, Free Brother Dan. Um, but I do know, I do know that this struggle to be free is something that we all can want can want and desire. The freedom that has bound us is the sin, sin. that has darkened sin. us. Amen. And that continues to, to grab hold of us and try to drag us back down to where we used to be. But God has delivered us from all of that. And for whatever happened to you before June 27, 2021, all that stuff is in the past. Amen. Everything from the time you were born up until now, that is past tense. And God is, wants to deliver you from the past tense and be your God in the present tense. Right now, I'm the God who delivered you in the past tense, brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And then he tells them, Do you won't, you will have no other God beside me. That's right. No other God. You realize that this is not a negative command? When we think of the Ten Commandments, kind of our brain just automatically goes to, well, that's all the thou shalt not. Mm -hmm. The don't, 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 don't. But look at it. It's a positive command. You will have God. You can have God. That's a command. How about that? And it's a positive statement. You can have God. You can have no other God. You don't need any other God. There isn't any other God. I love how sometimes uh, very, very intellectual uh, arguments can be put in such simplistic terms for people like me to, to study and read. And I was reading the C.S. Lewis book, and he put, he put this brilliant, brilliant saying into a, one of the one of his stories that he's telling, not even a theology book, a story that he's telling that I'm reading. And one of the characters says, well, I suppose there's, there's two ways to look at everything. And then the professor looks at him and says, huh, two ways? Oh, no, 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 no. There's dozens of ways to look at everything. That is, until you know the answer. Then there's never more than one. one way. That's right. Wow. That's wow. God's the way. That, that, just, that just floored me. There's people that are looking all over the place right. for something to fill that hole in their heart, that loneliness that they have, that, that need for God that we all have, that need for deliverance that we all have. And they look here, here, here. Well, maybe I'll take a bit of this and a bit of this and a bit of this and a bit of this, and I'll try this religious practice and this spirituality thing and I'll try this over here and instead we don't need any of that we can look all over the place and find dozens of answers until we find the real God and then there is only one 
Right. There never needs to be more than one. You will have no other gods beside me. Notice that word beside me or before me. You will have no other gods before me. That's what we call a preposition in English. And we had, uh, uh, there was a list of about 70 in English. And uh, I remember one class that I took and I ended up having to memorize them all, maybe 12th grade. And I memorized all of the prepositions in alphabetical order. Just kind of a fun game that I, I did. Just It was just a list, just spouting things off. And then I was really excited when I started reading studying the language here and realized in Hebrew, in this word, there's only seven prepositions. Now in English we've got 70 plus. But in Hebrew there's only seven. What that means is that each one of those Hebrew prepositions has got to cover a lot of ground. Okay? It has to, with one word, or in this case just one letter, it's just the letter B. It's got to cover all of the aspects, all of the spatial aspects that we can imagine. Okay? So let's, let's just uh, try to interpolate this. You will have no other gods before me. You will have no other gods behind me. You will have no other god beside me. You will have no other god above me. No other god below me. No other god around me. No other God near me. No other God in my presence. In other words, no other God. Put a dot on it. It's done. Period. There are no other gods. You're not going to have any more at all. You see, God does not want to be the number one God in your life. Out of a list of ten. These are my top ten gods. And God's saying, it's okay with me as long as you put me number one. No. God wants to be number one on a list of one. That's right. He wants to be the only, a short list. There's God and no other. You will have no other gods beside me. When we read the Ten Commandments, we recognize, and when we read the Bible, we recognize God's law is written in a couple of different ways. There's, there's different kinds of laws. There is the kind of law like this, which is a flat-out absolute command. That's right. Just, just a speech and just do it. Then there's other laws that we come across that are the if-then type laws, or in this case, law. Like, if the donkey falls in the ditch, then you've got to get it. If your ox gets out of the yard and hurts somebody, you've got to do this. And so we have a lot of those kind of laws later on. Well, all of the rest of the world, their old laws that come up, the code of this, the sky, the sky, the sky, all of the ancient laws of the world, they're all that kind. Mm -hmm. They're all case laws. Mm -hmm. Hardly ever outside of right here do you see a thou shalt not or do this because I said so. Mm -hmm. Just an absolute command. We don't find those anywhere else. And you know why? Because no other God can speak with this authority. That's right. And say, this is the way it is because I'm God and I said so. That's right. How about that? Mm -hmm. the, because I'm God and I said so, mm -hmm. that is the authority that God speaks here with the Ten Commandments. Right. And when we look at the Ten Commandments, there's a there's a couple of ways we want to we want to break it down. How how is it that we can know the Ten Commandments? Well, one way to know the Ten Commandments, the, the the lowest level of knowing the Ten Commandments is to be able to recite them. Well, I can recite them. I can memorize that list and spout it back to you. Now that does us just about as much good as say I can I can name all the all the seven dwarfs. Or I can I can rattle off all of, all of Santa's reindeer. I can say that list of eight. I can say I can memorize the list of ten commandments. That's one way to know them. Another way to know them, a little deeper level, is to understand what they mean. 
and to to get it and understand what's going on. And this is more like what you'd say, well, I know about the Ten Commandments. I know this means we should do this. Well, that's knowing them to recite them. And then the second way is knowing about them. But when we read the word know in the Bible, so that's why. experience. That's right. That means we got to live it. Right. Okay. That is how we need to seek to know the Ten Commandments. We need to be able to put it into our lives. And how is it we put this one into our lives? Have God, no other. And then we're done. Don't look anywhere else. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful to you for giving us your word. We're grateful to you for being the only God that is so interested in us that you would deliver us. Lord, as we celebrate that this morning, we ask you to make this truth come alive into our hearts so that we can know you have delivered us and that we owe you everything. You are our God. We are your people. Your name.